In the last section of this chapter, we want to compare the AREMA models that we've introduced in chapter nine with the ETS models that we introduced in chapter eight. Uh, some books will say that AREMA models are more general than exponential smoothing. That's actually a myth. They, there are some AREMA models that are equivalent to exponential smoothing models, but there's models in both classes that aren't available in the other class. So the linear exponential smoothing models, that is the ones with no multiplicative components. So there's six of them that have no multiplicative errors and no multiplicative seasonality or multiplicative trend. Those models are all special cases of ARIMA models. But any exponential smoothing model that has a multiplicative component, whether it's in the error or the seasonal part, it doesn't have an ARIMA equivalent model. On the other hand, there are lots of ARIMA models that have no exponential smoothing counterparts, including all of the stationary models and all of the models where P and Q are, are large, large numbers. It turns out that all the ETS models are not stationary, so that if you have a if you want a stationary model, you have to use the ARIMA class. Um, the models, the ETS models that have seasonality in them and that have a trend and not a damped trend, those ones have two unit roots. That is they're equivalent to two lots of differencing. Models that have a seasonal component and a damped trend, or a seasonal component and no trend or they might have no seasonal component, but they do have a trend, those, all, those models all have one lot of differencing in them. So you can think of the two families of models like this. The ETS models are a large class, um, or not a, they're a finite class, the ARIMA models are the really big class, but the ETS models are a class of models where you combine components like trend and seasonal components um, and if they're fully additive, so they're all either no trend or additive trend or no seasonality or additive seasonality, and if the error is additive, so their models have no multiplicative components, they sit here and there are an ARIMA equivalent for them. The models with multiplicative errors or the models with multiplicative seasonality, they sit out here um, and those models uh, do not have an equivalent ARIMA counterpart. On the ARIMA side, anything that's stationary or anything that's particularly large in terms of the number of parameters, it sits out here. Um, and there's potentially an infinite number of ARIMA models. And, the, and the, the philosophy behind an ARIMA model is to model autocorrelations in the data after differencing, whereas the philosophy behind an, behind an ETS model is to describe the series in terms of trend and seasonal and similar components. So the ones that are equivalent, we can write down, at least for the first three of them, the relationship between the parameters. So the ETS ANN model, simple exponential smoothing, uh, is equivalent to an ARIMA 011, where the MA parameter is alpha minus one. Holtz method with additive errors is an equivalent to an ARIMA 022, and Holtz method with damp trend um, is equivalent to an ARIMA 112. And there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the parameters. Interestingly, the parameter space for the ARIMA model is actually larger than the parameter space for the ETS model. Uh, just take the first example. For an ARIMA model, the theta parameter has to lie between minus one and one. Normally, for an ETS model, we require the alpha parameter to lie between zero and one. Um, but as you can see from the relationship, if we if we took the equivalent part of the the REMA space, theta between minus one and one, then alpha can be between zero and two. But we wouldn't normally consider alpha bigger than one for an ETS model, so the space is smaller. Similarly for the other two here. The bottom three models are a bit more complicated because there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between the parameters. There's only two smoothing parameters in this model, um, but there's M REMA parameters. There's three smoothing parameters in this model, and there's M plus one ARIMA parameters. So there's there's generally more ARIMA parameters than there is ETS parameters, so there has to be some constraints on them. They're also quite unusual models. You normally wouldn't pick a MA component as big as this. So if M was 12, for example, with monthly data, then you're talking about ARIMA 0012 
or Arima 0113, like they're big models and uh, not the sort of things that you would normally come across if you were choosing an Arima model yourself. Okay, so let's let's look at some examples where we compare the ETS class of models with the ARIMA class of models. So I'm going to do it for the Australian population data. So we take global economy, we pull out the Australian data, and we uh, divide by a million to make the numbers a bit easier to plot. Uh, and then I'm going to use a time series cross-validation approach. So we take the data and we stretch it, uh, where the initial data set is of length 10. So we need at least 10 observations to form a model. Um, and then of course, all of the rest of the data gets added in the, in the stretched civil. And for each model, we will fit an ETS model chosen automatically and an ARIMA model chosen automatically. And we'll forecast them uh, one step ahead and see how good they are. So this is the only way you can really compare an ETS model and an ARIMA model because you can't compare them on AIC because the likelihood of that the ETS model is calculated in a different way from the likelihood of the ARIMA model. So the resulting AIC or AICC statistic is not comparable. So to compare models with very different model classes like this, we have to use out of sample test sets. In this example, we can see that the um, ETS model has done quite a bit better than the ARIMA model. The, the root mean squared error is much smaller. Um, and any of the other test statistics, measures of accuracy, also suggest the ETS model is better. If we take the ETS model then and then apply it to the whole data set uh, and forecast ahead, we can get forecasts that look like that. And as you can see, they've picked up the end of the series trend very nicely projected it forward, very narrow prediction intervals. This is a really nice model for the population. Let's do another example. This time we'll do a seasonal example. So we'll take the Australian cement production from 1988 to the end of 2007, and we'll build a model just on that training set, uh, both an ARIMA model chosen automatically and an ETS model chosen automatically. Um, and that's what the ARIMA model looks like. A 101211. Uh, so, you know, quite a complicated model with a lot of different parameters doing things and a drift to get the, the trend in the forecasts. The ETS model doesn't have a trend. It has multiplicative seasonality and multiplicative errors. Um, and it looks like that. The season the gamma parameter is very small here. Um, so that means that the seasonality is not changing much from period to period. Now, as I said, the, you can't compare the AICC statistics here. So this number is not comparable to this number. Just because the ARIMA one is smaller doesn't mean it's a better model because they're computed differently. The only way to choose between these is on the test set. Let's look at the residuals. So the residuals for the ARIMA model look like that. Everything looks great, look well behaved, no obvious issues. The ETS model also looks pretty good. Uh, there's no obvious issues there. All of the spikes in the ACF are inside the, the blue lines. The time plot looks like it's not just noise. The histogram looks fairly normal. So not much to tell between the two models just looking at those graphs. If we do long box test statistics on them, there is the one for the ARIMA model. Remember for an ARIMA model, we need to include the degrees of freedom that's used in the number of uh, AR and MA terms. So the degrees of freedom is six here. And uh, it comes out to be you know, quite a large p-value. So there's no problems with this model. That the residuals are not significantly different from white noise. If we did it for the ETS model, again, there's not much to tell between these models. This is also passes the test. We don't use the degrees of freedom for an ETS model. Uh, the p-value is also bigger than 0.05. So you can't tell the difference between these two models based on the in-sample analysis of the residuals. If we compare them out of sample on the subsequent two and a half years of data that are available, we can see that the ARIMA model actually does slightly better here than the, than the ETS model. In, in all of the measures, the ARIMA model is slightly better than the ETS models. That's the one we would use. 
So here's a graph of the forecasts from the uh, ARIMA model uh, with the two and a half years of actual data shown as well. So you can see what they look like. So it's not a great model there because the, you've, the, the actual values are lying sort of close to the edge of the prediction intervals. Um, probably the inside interval, which should be 80%, is covering less than 80% of the actual values. Um, so that suggests the prediction intervals might be a little bit too narrow here. Um, but otherwise, it looks like a good model. <laughs>